Hello everyone! Welcome back to the Action RPG Lessons. In lesson number 5, we're going to add a non-playable character, or NPC, to the game. He'll help us out by giving us a sword. First, let's add a class and a sprite for this character. I'm going to name the class NPC, short for non-playable character. Now this NPC also needs a sprite, so let's open up the Asset Store and search through it until you find the Mystery Man sprite. I'm going to select that asset and I'm just going to name him NPC. Let's go ahead and add the NPC to our game. At the bottom here, I'm going to add a few more lines I'm going to give this NPC the name Mystery Guy. He's very mysterious. And he equals an NPC. I'll go ahead and add the sprite to him too. So Mystery Guy dot sprite equals sprite. And inside the brackets we'll say NPC dot PNG. So I'm going to put this guy down at the bottom of the screen. I'm not going to adjust his X, I'm just going to adjust his Y. So I'm going to say mysteryguy.y equals negative 250. There he is. Now this guy's quite small, just like the other ones. So let's go ahead and increase his size. Inside the NPC start, I'm going to say self.scalex equals 2 and self.scale y equals 2. So that he matches up with the others. There he is, it's looking good. Now we can walk over to the mystery guy, but we can't interact with him yet. Now this character isn't going to move around or attack, but we will be able to talk to him. Now in order to talk to him, we have to be close enough to him. And for that, we can use a collision check. Let's head over to the player and see if they collide with the NPC. So I'm going to add a couple lines and make sure you're right up against the wall here for this new collision check. I'm going to say if get collision between self and NPC. So, how do we talk to them? Well, we don't just want to always talk to them if we're colliding with them. We only want to talk to them when we press a button. So what we can do is add another if statement. That's right, you can have an if statement inside another if statement. We call that a nested if statement. So here we're going to check if key was pressed. And I'm going to check the E key. So with this, first we're checking if we're colliding with the NPC in the first place. And if we are, we're then checking if we press the E key. And what happens when it, both those conditions are true? Well, we're going to print a message. Let's start simple and just print the message, hi. So if I go and play my game and I walk over to the NPC, right now I'm colliding with them. And if I press the E key, the message shows up. And you can interact with them as many times as you want. And it doesn't work if I'm over here and pressing E. So. Like I said earlier, we want this NPC to give us a sword. So let's change this message to reflect that. In order to accommodate my message, I'm going to change one thing about this print message. Instead of using the apostrophe, I'm going to use quotation marks. Now that's only important because I need to use an apostrophe inside the message to say it's dangerous. 
I'll say it's dangerous out there. Take this sword. And just like that, if I test it out, I get that message instead. Nice. So, how do we actually keep track of if the player has the sword or not? Well, we're going to add another variable. So headed back to the start, and let's look at another type of variable. Sometimes we just want to check if something is true or false, whether we have the sword or not. And for that, we use a simple variable called a boolean. Now, just like any other variable, we can give it any name we want. So I'm going to call this one self dot has sword. Now, a boolean can either equal true or false. It's named after George Boole, who invented this kind of coding logic. So when we create a boolean, we can either say true or false. Now, since the player doesn't have the sword at the start, we do want it to be false. We want to set has sword to true as soon as we talk to that NPC, because he's the one that's giving it to us. So, head down to the bottom line. You might have to scroll to the right a little bit. And here, we're going to say self dot has sword equals true. Awesome, we have a sword. Now the problem is our code doesn't do anything with that sword yet. In the real world, we know that as soon as we have a sword, we can start swinging it around. But in our game, the computer doesn't have that information yet. All we have is a true or a false. So we need to add the functionality of that sword. How does the sword work? Well, for that, we need to do a couple things. First, we need to create another class. I'm going to call this class sword slash. Head back to the asset store and search for the sword slash sprite. And add it to your game. I'm going to name it sword. And it's going to be a PNG file. There it is. So whenever we have the sword, we want to be able to press a certain key to activate it. Let's add another if statement down below here. So first, we want to check if we have the sword in the first place. So we say if self dot has sword is equal to true. And yes, we are supposed to have those two equal signs. This is shorthand for is equal to. So we're checking if has sword is equal to true. We only use these when we're doing a check of some kind, like inside an if statement. Now, if we have the sword, we next want to check if we press a certain key. So we're saying if key was pressed, and I'm going to use the F key for this sword slash. So if both those conditions are true, we're going to create this sword slash object. So I'm just going to name this one attack, and it's going to equal a sword slash class. Now instead of setting the sprite here, I'm going to show you another trick. Inside the sword slash, in the start, we're going to set the sprite right here. Every time we create a sword slash object, it's automatically going to set its own sprite for us. So here we can say self dot sprite equals sprite. And inside we have the sword dot png. No matter where or when we create a sword slash object, it's always going to have that sprite. Let's try it out. If I hit play, 
I have to first go collect my sword. There we go. And if I press F, hey, I created a sword slash. Now the problem is, it doesn't seem to be repeating. Well, that's because whenever we create an object, it appears in the center of the screen. We are creating multiple sword slashes, but they're always in the middle. They're just on top of each other. So we need to modify our code a little bit. First things first, let's make it a bit bigger, just like the other ones. We can say self.scaleX equals 2 and self.scaleY. Our next task is to position the sword wherever the player is. That sounds more complex than it actually is. Let's head back to the player loop and look at our code here again. So whenever we create a new attack, we need to change its position to be wherever the player is. Luckily, the player knows where the player is. All we have to do is match up their X and Y. We can say attack.x equals self.x. And we can say attack.y equals self.y. And just like that, when you collect the sword, you can create a sword slash wherever you are. You can fill up the entire screen. So notice that whenever I create a sword slash, it's always in the same direction. It's always to the right. Even if I'm facing left or up or down. And for that, we need to add a different kind of variable. Head back to the start, and we're going to add what we call a string. Now a string is words, it's letters. You can remember it as a string of letters. This variable is going to be called direction and it's going to equal down. And that's how we create a string. We put it inside some apostrophes. Now, as you can probably guess, we're going to use this variable to keep track of which direction the player is facing. And for that, we need to look at our movement code again. So every time we change direction, we need to update that direction variable. So I'm going to add another line here. And if I press the up key, I'm going to say self.direction equals up. And I'm going to do the same thing for every other direction. There we go. But this one is going to be down. And next we're going to do right. and then left. So right now, all we're doing is changing this variable around. We're not actually using it yet. Let's go ahead and do so. Whenever we press the F key to create our sword slash, we're going to change its angle using that direction variable. Down here, I'm going to add another if statement. We're gonna say if self.direction is equal to up. So if the direction is up, we want to make the sword slash rotate so it's facing up. So in order to modify the direction that the sword slash goes, we need to modify the angle of it. So we can say attack.angle, and we want to set this equal to 90. This is going to rotate the object 90 degrees counterclockwise. You can see the effect when I hit play. If I'm looking up, hey, look at that. If I'm looking to the right, I still get the right version. Now we just need to do the left and down directions. So let's go ahead and add those. If I say if self direction equals down. Well, I want to rotate it clockwise, so I'm going to use attack.angle 
equals negative 90, the opposite direction. And then finally, if self dot direction equals left, we're going to say attack dot angle equals 180. That'll flip it all the way around. Let's test it out. We got up, we got right, we got down, we got left. All right. Test it out yourself. We've just got a different problem now, one that's pretty easy to fix. We can create as many sword slashes as we want, but they don't disappear. So in order to fix this, we need to do one last thing in our sword slash, and that's give it a self-destruct timer. Now this is just going to be another integer variable. I'm just going to call it timer, and it's going to equal 30. Now this doesn't mean 30 seconds. What it's actually going to be is 30 frames, which is about half a second. Inside the loop, we're going to count down that timer. So we need to say self dot timer minus equals one. And when that timer reaches zero, so we need to say if self dot timer is less than zero, we're going to destroy it. And finally, our sword is almost complete. We're just going to do one more modification to make the sword appear a little bit away from the player when it gets created. For that we need to go back into the player loop and scroll back down to where we were creating the sword. And here, whenever we change the angle of the attack, we're going to change its position by a little bit. So if we're trying to slash upwards, we should increase the attack's y by a little bit. So we can say attack dot y plus equals 50. That way, whenever I swing the sword upwards, it appears above the player. We're going to do the same thing for each other direction. If it's below the player, we're going to decrease the y by 50. If it's to the left, we're going to decrease the x. And finally, we do need to check if the direction is right, just to make it move a little bit over to the right. Attack.x plus equals 50. So now, when you swing your sword, you get a little bit of range on it. Awesome. So you might notice that the sword slash doesn't actually slash anything. Well, we're going to be covering that in the challenge lesson that's coming up. I'll see you there.